صدرا ووضعنا عند وزرك الذي انقض ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فان مع الاسر يسرا ان مع الاسر يسرا فاذا فرغت فمن صب الى ربنا فرغا. قال الله تعالى في الفرقان الحميد ومن تكن منكم امه يدعون الى الخير يامرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر فاولئك هم المفلحون. صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على محمد النبي الامي وعلى اله وسلم تسليما before i start my short talk and share a few sentiments i would like to thank and extend my gratitude to the organizers and then i would like to thank you for coming But before we start, I would like each person to check where their heart lies right now. We're sitting in programs like this, learning about our beautiful religion. Our intention has to be sound. If the intention is not sound, the time spent, energy spent, will be of waste. So it is very important that we check our niyat, our intention, and if there is any deficiency in the intention, we can correct it straight away. Our sitting here is to please Allah and Allah alone. That's why they say in Urdu, "Ek hai jana, ek hai manna." Jante to ham hai, mante. So one is gaining knowledge. And one is the implementation of knowledge. So alhamdulillah, knowledge is not too far away. It is the push of a button. But the implementation of that knowledge is more desired. And that is the objective of collecting knowledge. So whatever we learn today, first of all, the address is to myself. And then it is to the noble audience. And we go back home with the intention that I will improve. If we study the Ummat, we will come to know that every Muslim has some concern for his faith. Every Muslim, some concern. Some have little more concern than others, but everyone has some concern. And if I was to travel from Brisbane to Sydney today, I know that I have to cover 1,000 Ks. If I cover 990, I'm close to my destination, but I'm not there. If I cover 900, I'm close to my destination, but I'm not there. Likewise, we will find, if everyone analyzes myself, yourself, we will find that there are a few Ks left to reach the reward that Allah has promised. To reach the reward that the Prophet of Allah has promised. That hayatan tayyiba, that blissful life. It may be deficiency it may be a mistake that we are committing with our eyes that is not allowing us to cross that last obstacle it may be the tongue it may be another body part but there has to be some deficiency in our life that is not allowing us to meet the rada of Allah the pleasure of Allah because if the pleasure of Allah is on our side then our condition will change so some people may have to cover 20%, some people may have to cover 30%, and every percent is connected to a body part. Because this body produces good or it produces bad. It is a machine. It is a factory that produces good or produces bad. Based upon what we send to Allah, we will find the reward or the punishment for it. So we correct our niyat before we start the small talk and I'll give you a few seconds for that and we can check everyone knows where the heart lies heart is very very important you know the Prophet of Allah says there's a hadith in Ibn Majah that uh, a angel 
does not descend into a house where there is a picture of a living being hanging. So the angel does not descend in that house. So if there's any picture in the heart other than Allah, how will Allah descend into that heart? So the heart has to be very pure, it has to be very sound. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سليم. That when a person dies, this box, this heart, it will be captured, presented. Whatever is placed in this heart, based upon it, the treatment will be given to that human being. The verse that I recited is a verse from Surah Ali Imran, and it is a principal verse in relation to da'wah. Amr bil ma'roof, nahi anil munkar. Promoting good, enjoining good, preventing people, communities from committing their body to bad, to evil and vice. The principal verse is in Surah Ali Imran, that is the third surah of the Quran, and it is verse 104. So you can note this, go back, and then you can study it. In which Allah says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ that in the nation of the Prophet of Allah, there should be a certain group. That makes it their duty to perform Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Now, to understand what Allah is saying from this verse, we have to understand the background of this verse. As we know, that there are many surahs in the Quran, 114 to be precise of unequal length and there are some surahs that were received by the Prophet of Allah before reaching Medina and I'm referring to the journey of Hijrah those surahs those ayat are known as Makki and anything that the Prophet of Allah received after migration it may be in Medina it may be back in Mecca in the conquest of Mecca it will be considered as Madani and according to the scholars, 86 surahs are Makki and 28 surahs are Madri. And then there are many verses that were sent without any reason. There's no shan in Azul, no background. And there are many, many verses that were sent down with a reason, due to a reason. So this verse in Surat Ali Imran, verse 104, there is a shan in Azul to it, there's a background. As we know that when the Prophet of Allah arrived in Medina to Munawwar, the first group that drew the attention of the Prophet of Allah were the Jewish people. And the Jewish people were very, very strong as they are nowadays. They were controlling the markets, they were controlling the funds, the economy. And they were known to be people of knowledge. So people used to consult with them in matters of religion. And there were three main tribes, Banu Nadir, Banu Qaduqa, and Banu Quraiza. Then Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, Raisul Munafiqun, the leader of the Munafiq, he emerged. And he had his own group, known as the Munafiqun, the hypocrites. Then the Ansar that consisted of two tribes, Aus and Khazraj. Then there were Christians that used to reside in Medina and they used to reside in Najran. Then there were the Sa'ibin, those that used to claim that they were following Hazrat Dawood And then there were the Majus, the fire worshippers. So there were so many different groups. But each group was intimidated by the Jewish people. So much so that the idolaters, and I'm referring to the Aus and the Khazraj, that when they used to walk in the street, if they used to see a Jewish person walking towards them, they used to change the path, respecting the Jewish person. If they needed their daughter to marry somebody, they used to consult with the Jewish person. So they were so intimidated. And that's why when the Prophet of Allah came with the message, they went to the Jewish rabbis. And they consulted with them and they said, look, you tell us and guide us. Are these, is this person a prophet or is he an imposter? 
So they used to consult with these people. Now when the Prophet of Allah came, the first thing that he did is he gave the Sahaba a boost. He put them on the right path known as the Sirat al-Mustaqeen and he taught them the creed of faith. This is very important in line to da'wah. We always hear that La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah means that there is none worthy of worship but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger and the servant of Allah. But there are many different translations to the creed of faith. One being La Muhawwaf illallah. That we do not fear anyone but Allah. La Marjuwa illallah. We do not place our hope with anyone but Allah. La Ma'buda illallah. We do not worship anyone but Allah. So the Prophet of Allah taught the Sahaba that you should not be intimidated. Hold your head high. Be proud of what you have now. Don't live in the past. Live in the present. Because the present is a present. The present is a present. It's a gift. Live in it. Don't dwell in the past. Now what happened is that the same Sahaba that used to bow in front of the Jewish people, consult with them in their worldly life. They started to consult with the Prophet of Allah. When they needed their daughters to get married, they used to consult with the Prophet of Allah. In early days, they used to make salam. But the Prophet of Allah said, from today onwards, you should know that you should not give salam to a non-believer. The best that you can do is that if you have to initiate the salam, the greeting, you say, As-salamu ala man al huda. This is the salam that a Muslim gives to a non-Muslim if he has to initiate it. As-salamu ala man al huda. Peace be upon those that follow the guidance. Now when this treatment was encountered by the Jewish people, they were started to burn within. They could not endure this. The Aws and the Khazraj, if you study the condition of the Arab people, and I'm referring to the people that used to reside in the Arabian Peninsula, prior to the arrival of the Prophet of Allah, you will come to know that there were many battles between them. Some battles lasted for 40 years, some for 60 years, and there was one certain battle that lasted for 120 years. And who benefited from all this? Certain groups. When Muslims fight, certain groups benefit from this. Now a prophet comes to free a person from slavery. The slavery of makhluk and then places that makhluk in front of Allah. Meaning bow in front of one and you don't have to bow in front of anyone else. A prophet comes to save humanity. It has been made mention by Alama Alusi in Ruh al Ma'ani. This is a very famous book of Tafsir. That when Moses, peace be upon him, was placed in the basket and then placed in the river, and then Allah controlled the flow of the water, there were 800 servants working in the palace of Pharaoh. 800. One servant picked up the basket, presented it to Asiya bint Mazahim, the wife of Pharaoh. Allah softened the heart of the lady. And then the miracle takes place that Pharaoh, the tyrant, his heart becomes soft. And he says that we will adopt this child. Straight away, to express his enjoyment and his pleasure, he frees 800 slaves. Alama Alusi in Ruh al Ma'ani, he derives a very special point from this. And he says, when prophets come, they become the means of liberty. They become the means of freedom. So, Prophet Muhammad arrives in Medina. These people that were enslaved mentally, physically, the Prophet of Allah freed them. So, this was not taken too well by the Jewish people. So one day the Aws and the Khazar that were fighting for many, many years, that now were bonded. 
became close due to the beautiful religion. Aus and Khazraj sitting together, enjoying the company of each other, eating together. There was one Jewish person by the name of Shammas bin Qais, who was a Jewish person. He passed this gathering and he remembered the past where he had the advantage of controlling these people. And now he could see that he could not divide and rule. He wanted to experience what they were experiencing for many years. Suddenly has changed. So he went back home. He hired the service of one person that could cause commotion. And we find people in our communities that, that strive upon this. They live upon this. They cause commotion. Fitna. He went and he saw these two groups sitting, enjoying the company of each other. And he reminded them the battles that took place between these two groups. He reminded them of the battles. So for a split moment, they slipped. And there was a fight between the Muslims, the Sahaba. And it reached a level where both parties took a vow. That we will meet in the arena after a few days and we will settle the matter there. Now when the Prophet of Allah came to know this, the Prophet of Allah, he made such a struggle, such an effort to bring these people on one unified platform. When he found that that platform was shattered and it was collapsing, it hurt the Prophet of Allah and he came. And with very stern words, he made nasiha to the Sahaba. And then Allah Rabbul Izzat sent down the verses, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ كُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَةً Don't forget those days when you were scattered and you were fragmented and there was discord amongst you and you were disunited and you were on the edge. The Prophet of Allah came, united you, uh, gathered you. And then after this, Allah sends the verse, وَلْتَكُمْ minkum." There should be one group amongst you. The scholars say there were a few people that did not take an active part in the fight. But they stood far away, but did not intervene. Understood? They stood far away, did not intervene. For those people that did not intervene and defuse the situation, Despite having the ability, as we will make mention, Allah speaks about those people in verse 104, Surah Ali Imran, and says that there should be a group. When two Muslims are fighting, they should stand up. And they should become a barricade between two parties. They should try to defuse the situation. This is a principal verse in relation to Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi anil Munkar. The second principal verse in regards to Amr bil Ma'aruf and Nahi an al Munkar is in Surah Tawbah. Surah Tawbah is the ninth surah of the Quran and it is verse 71 in which Allah says, Wal mu'minuna wal mu'minatu ba'dhuhum awliya'u ba'd. Believers, men and women, are friends of one another. Now, how do they express that friendship? Is a friendship a may statement? Is it lip service that I love you? No. But if a person is a true believer, then he is a friend of another believer and there are a few signs. For every claim, there's a proof. I can say that this mosque belongs to me, I bought it. I can make that claim, but I have to prove it. For every claim, there's a proof. So in Surah Tawbah, verse 71, Allah makes mention of the proof. That they enjoin good and prevent evil. Believers that are friends of one another. And they establish prayer. The discharge of the zakat. And they obey Allah and the Rasul. These are a few signs of a belief. Now, 
Coming back to the topic, there are two kinds of da'wah that a person gives. Remember this, there are two kinds of da'wah that a person gives. One da'wah is infirad. Second da'wah is ijtima'i. And I will explain that in detail. Infaradi means on an individual base. Ijtima'i means on a collective base. The rules pertaining to an infiradi da'wah, an individual da'wah, is very different than the rules pertaining to a collective da'wah. For example, the Prophet of Allah says, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyati. Everyone is responsible for his flock. Keep this one statement in mind. Second statement of the Prophet of Allah, Man ra'a minkum munkaran fal yugayyirhu biyadi fa illam yastati fa bilisani fa illam yastati fa bi qalbi wa dhalika adha'afu al-iman. This is the second statement. If we see wrong, physically stop it. If you are in the position to do so. If not, verbally stop it. Speak against it if you are in the position. And if not, dislike it. And I will make mention what is the meaning of dislike it. Dislike it from the heart. And this is the weakest form of imam. These two statements of the Prophet of Allah that come to us through sound narration will assist us in knowing and determining and establishing the rules pertaining to an infiradi da'wah. An individual da'wah. The Prophet of Allah says, <coughs> That if you see wrong, stop it. That every person is a da'i. This is our mission. It is our mission to be a da'i. To promote, to propagate. Allah reward Rabbi bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala. Allah reward Rabbi bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala. When he was deputed by Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala in 14 Hijri. When Rustam was standing with 82,000 soldiers ready to stamp over, trample over the Muslim army of 8,000 in the leadership of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. But Rustam thought in his mind that I would like to speak to a Muslim before I trample over these people. So Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala appointed Hazrat Rabi bin Amr. And he said, I would like you to go in the clothes that you are wearing without any change. Because Allah gave us izzat in what we are. We don't have to make a change to accommodate anyone. So Rabbi bin Amr, radiallahu ta'ala an, he went into the palace. And with his stick, with a pointy stick, he was tearing all the fabric that was placed on the right and the left, made out of silk. Like he gave it no importance that this is only a fabric. This has no significance in my life. And he stood right in front of Kisra. One of the kings of the superpowers of that time. And what did the Prophet of Allah say about Kisra when he tore the letter? إِذَا هَلَكَ كِسْرَى فَلَا كِسْرَى بَعْدَ Once Kisra is destroyed, there will be no Kisra after that. They will never ever taste the glory that they tasted before. Never ever taste the glory. So he stood there. And then Kisra reminded him of who they were. And he said that the Romans have some civilization. We have some civilization. We are educated. You people are uneducated. Your living is with camels. And you live in the deserts. You have no rules pertaining to cleanliness. And now you think that you can come and defeat us? You think you come here and defeat us? On what basis have you come here? What has compelled you? What has given you that encouragement that you stand in front of Kisr? How do you think that 8,000 people will defeat an army of 82,000 led by Rustam? And what beautiful words were uttered by this person. Allah reward him. And that is our maqsad. Every person is a da'i. He said, Jitna, 
من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد ومن جور الأديان إلى عدل الإسلام ومن ذيق الدنيا إلى سعة الآخر First of all, the first word, the first verb that he used, he said, Jitna. Urdu me kete, ben laya gya ho ya. Khud nia ya ma. Ben beja gya ho ya. I have been sent here. I have not come myself. Allah has sent me here. Huwaj tabakum, each person that has been chosen for this work. It is not the work of a person. It is not the work of a group. It is not the work of a jama'at. It is the work of every single person to give da'wah in his capacity that we will elaborate upon. Jitna, I have been sent him. I am the ambassador of the creator of heaven and earth. And what have I come with? What is my maqsir? لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ To take people out from the slavery of mankind and to place them in front of their khanah. ألف لام را كتاب أنزل الله إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور. This Quran has been sent down to take people out of the valleys of darkness and to place them in the valleys of light. الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور. A saint of Allah is that person that leads people out of darkness towards light. والذين كفروا أولياءهم الطاغوت يخرجونهم من النور إلى الظلمات. The enemies of Allah, the Ta'ud, the Satan, the ideology that is projected by the Satan. Evil, ism, sin, whatever is in contradiction to the laws of Allah can be translated as Ta'ud. People that follow that system, they take people out of light and place them in the valleys of darkness. He said, I have come here by Allah. I have been sent by Allah here. To take people out and think about it. Don't concentrate upon the words. I want you to concentrate upon the station where he stands. One person standing in front of the king of the time. How could, where, where did he get the courage from? To stand there and speak to Kisra. Look it into his eyes. Without perspiring, without sweating, without the slightest tremble in his body, without shivering. And he says, I've come to take everyone out of the slavery of mankind. Meaning that you have made people slaves out of your slavery. And to place them in front of Allah. And from the wrongs of the systems that people have made towards the fairness and the adl and the justice of deen, Islam. وَمِنْ ذِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَعَةِ الْآخِرِ And from the narrowness of this world, a person that lives for this world, what is his ambitions? What are his goals? Very limited, very restricted, very small. Allah says, مَتَاعٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا قَلِيمٌ This world and whatever it contains is very little. So if a person has ambitions for something that is little, what ambitions does he have? I have come to take people out of the narrowness of this world and introduce them to the vastness of Akhir. He says these words in front of Kisra. I'm going to put a question to you. If a person is not proud of his faith and he's not confident about his faith, how can he utter this statement? This statement is a projection of his faith. The commitment, the conviction, not the, not the commitment, the conviction that he has of his faith. How proud he is that he can stand there and utter these words in front of a person. These words are introducing his execution. These words, if you think about it, is an invitation to his own execution. But he's so proud. He feels privileged. A person cannot give da'wah in the true sense. Cannot give an effective da'wah if he's not proud about what he is. If we have any doubt in what we are and what we hold, any doubt about our religion, we cannot stand there and propagate that religion with soundness, with firmness. It cannot happen. Rabbi bin Ahmad was very proud and he stood there and he spoke about 
دين كيس راس الحاو دي حاو دي In those days to disgrace people, what they used to do is they used to get a pot of clay and put it on the head. In those days they didn't execute the ambassadors. With the exception of Hussein al-Kadhab, he did. So clay pot, you know, he got a vessel and he filled it up with clay and said, put it on the head of this person. Rabbi bin Amr, he held that vessel of clay and ran out. And when he made it to Sa'ad bin Abi Baqas, he said, what happened? He said, I brought the first installment. I brought the first installment. We will take over Iran. We will take over Persia. A battle took place for three days. The fourth day, victory was given. The fourth day, the victory was given. When Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, and this is very important, and this is connected to what we are speaking about. When Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas was sitting in the palace, where a few days ago, Kisra was sitting, where there was silk, lying on the floor pearls rubies diamonds and gold lying on the floor Saad bin Abi Waqqas sitting there started to weep profusely and somebody came to him and he said why are you crying this is a day to rejoice and he recited a verse from Surah Dukhan Surah Dukhan is the 44th Surah of the Quran Dukhan smoke and verse 25 onwards and I would like you to go back home and study these verses in the context that I have presented to you. Allah speaks about Pharaoh. Allah speaks about Pharaoh. How many people have left Jannat? Gardens, Wa'uyun, and fountains behind. How many? Pharaoh had so much, he left it all behind. Was the ru'in wa baqamin kareem? Fields full of vegetation and crops left behind. And beautiful dwellings. Wa na'matin kanu fi hafat. And so many numerous bounties. Countless, numerous bounties were given to these people, and they used to live on that. Allah replaced them with somebody else. And when these people died, they had to make shukr for these bounties. They did not make shukr. What happened when these people died? The sky, the heaven, the earth did not cry for them, did not weep from them. Imam Tabari makes mention in Tafsir Tabari under this verse, Surah Dukhan, verse 25 onwards, he makes mention that when a noble person passes away, the place where he makes sajda cries for him because it remembers the sajda of a mu'min. The sky cries for him because there is a door for a human being through which his deeds are presented. And based upon what he presents, Allah sends the circumstances through the other door. The doors are closed. If I place fragrance on my body, he will smell it and he will benefit from it. If this is a fragrance shop and somebody just passes through, does not take advantage of the fragrance but just passes through, he will smell nice. The good deeds used to pass through these doors. The blessed used to be experienced by the doors as well. Allah says when these people die, not even the heavens, not even the earth cries. And they're not given respite when Allah makes that final decision. So Hazrat Rabbi bin Amir has informed us of our maqsad. This is our maqsad of life. Every person is a da'i in his capacity. Now sometimes we'll start from the basics. Keeping the two statements that I made mention of the Prophet of Allah. And we're talking about infiradi da'wah, individual da'wah. Every person is responsible for his flock. We're talking about the home. If we cannot reform the people in the house, it is impossible to reform the community outside. If I cannot implement the laws of Allah on this body, I cannot expect that the laws of Allah will be implemented in the world. I have to start from myself. 
I have to start from myself. You know when the plane, it's amazing, once I was sitting in the plane, you must have thought about this many a times. They give you a demonstration and they say that if there is a lack of oxygen, the mask will fall. And if you think about it, there's a child sitting there who does not know how to apply that mask on his face. You will think that, all right, place the mask on the child and then take care of yourself. But that's the wrong procedure. What do they instruct us to do? Take care of yourself first. Then take care of your child. Because you do not want to leave him without the assistance of an adult. Take care of yourself. If we can't implement the laws of our body, how do we expect it to be implemented in the world? Five foot six inch person, he cannot implement the laws of Allah on himself and he speaks about others. So the Prophet of Allah says, first of all, you are responsible for your flock. So we have to start from our homes. We have to see where we stand, where our wife stands, where our children stand. And then we apply the hadith of the Prophet of Allah. If you are in the position to reform the people in the home, or even the people outside, physically, physically, you have to reform them. But we're gonna, I'm going to give you a few guidelines regarding this. Now keep in mind, our maqsad, remember the maqsad, this is a very important point that I am trying to convey. The maqsad is to pull the people out. Pull the people out of evil. Pull the people out of darkness. And people are different. So we don't have one standard formula for every person. It's not like a flock of sheep. That one shepherd has one stick and he controls the entire flock. People are of different temperaments, different mizaj, different understanding. We have to analyze that. Oram Zeb Alamgi Rahimahullah. His uh, book, very known, uh, very well known, Fatawa Alamgi, that was compiled by the assistance of 500 ulama. Oram Zeb Alamgi Rahimahullah. And I've been to the place in India where he used to sell the caps. Yeah, for his livelihood. I've been to that place in Dili. So two people were presented. Two people were summoned. They did some wrong. It was the same crime. It was the same wrong. So Aurangzeh Alamgi said about one person, it's called Daskorela. Fifth, ten whips. The other person committed the same crime and he said to him, Sharaniyati to me. You have no shame. That's it. To one, ten whips. To the second person, Sharamiyati. You have no shame, that's it. Finished. They went home. The people in the court, they said, Hazrat, how? To one person, you said, you have no shame. He committed the same crime. The other person, he committed the same crime, he said, ten whips. He said, yeah, ten whips, well, I did. The person that I whipped, you know, ten whips, he's a stubborn person. Before you ask me, go and find out where they are sitting, these two people. So this person went and he went, looked into the house of that person that was whipped and found that he inside he was enjoying. He was laughing, his family, no worries. No worries. Deed? Like Madrasa maybe, because bachi mark Deed? So he was laughing there like nothing had happened. He went to the other person. And he found that he's sitting down, he's got a chadar over himself, a cloth, and he's crying, weeping. He was a sensitive person. For him, Sharankar, that was enough. For him, Sharankar, that was enough. Same thing is, with the people in our house, we have to understand the massage, the temperament. Some children may be very sensitive. If we overdo it, overcook it, what happens? God. You cook, overcook the curry. No one's going to eat it. You may use a method that is fine, that is jais. You know, you juice, it is fine, permissible, but it may not be the right method for that person. One person, he has flu. The second person has flu. But the doctor does not give the same tablet because he may have some other sicknesses with the flu. He has to analyze all the sicknesses and then give a tablet. Understood? Likewise, the children are of different massage. The wife may be of a different massage. That's why in the Quran, there are different methods of 
penalizing a person. Sometimes you have to be stern. Sometimes you have to be soft. The very famous incident that the Prophet of Allah was sitting in the mosque and one person came. Think about it. One person came in the masjid and he made dua. Allahumma arhamni wa muhammadan wa la tarham ma'ana ahad. Oh Allah have mercy on me and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and no one else. He makes this dua. Sahaba sitting there. Oh Allah have mercy on me and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and no one else. And then that same person stood up, went into the corner of the mosque and started to urinate. Pashab kiya, masjid kiya. Wohi adhani. Few moments ago he made this dua that didn't sit well with the Sahaba because he excluded the Sahaba and then he stands up, goes into the corner and starts to urinate. The hadith is in Muslim that the Prophet of Allah says, La tazrimu. Now the Sahaba want to stand up and you know, flog him. What are you doing? This is a masjid. The Prophet of Allah says, No. Leave him. Because if you chase him, then he will implode the entire mosque. Now leave him there, he does not know. Then the Prophet of Allah, once he relieved himself, summoned him and then told him that the first dua that you made was wrong. You should not limit the mercy of Allah and Bulliza to yourself and you. Allah's mercy is unlim unlimited, so include everyone in Allah's mercy. And second, the masjid is the house of Allah, Allah. It is not a place where you relieve yourself. Now, we have to understand the mizad. The Prophet of Allah, Ajit, one person comes to the Prophet of Allah. How pure the Prophet? How pure the Prophet? One person comes to the Prophet of Allah and he says, Oh, Prophet of Allah, I want to ask you a rule. Yes. Give me ijazat of zina. Clear hukum in the Quran in Surah Bani Sa'id, Wala taqrabu zina. Do not even go close to zina, fornication. Meaning, do not look at the avenues of zina. Do not speak about the avenues of zina. Do not walk towards the avenues of zina. And he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, give me ijazat for zina. So what did the Prophet of Allah do? Isn't this a munkar? Isn't it a munkar? It's a munkar. But did the Prophet of Allah correct him physically? That said, Umar come, isko do din kore laga. Understood the mizaj of the person. We have to understand the sickness. Before we prescribe a method of da'wah, we have to diagnose the problem. If we don't make the right diagnose of the problem, the method will not work. Prophet of Allah took him, placed his Mubarak hand on his shoulder. And this is a touch of affection. Whenever you speak to your child, remember this. Imam Nawi rahimahullah has extracted from this that whenever you give some advice to somebody younger than you, place your hand on his shoulders. He will feel that he is a dost. Straight away he will feel that, yes, I can confide in this person. He's a well-wisher. The Prophet of Allah placed his blessed hand on his shoulder and said, Come. He said, look, <clears throat> would you like anyone to make zina with your mother? He said, no. And then the Prophet of Allah mentioned the relatives, mother, sister. He said, the girl that you intend to commit this crime with, she's the mother of somebody, she's the daughter of somebody. And then the Prophet of Allah placed his Mubarak hand on his heart. And then the Sahabi says that out of all the things that I dislike, this is the worst. I will not go close to it. But the Prophet of Allah understood the mizaj of the person, the temperament of the person. And then prescribed the medicine. Then prescribed the medicine as Aurangzeb Alam did with one, the whip, with one, stern words. So we have to be very, very careful with our children with our flock, with our flock. We are not sheep, we are not cattle, we are not goats. No, we have to understand. Now, the scholars have said that when a person is giving da'wah, when a person is giving da'wah, and remember this, very, very important. Sometimes, you know, there are two kinds of people. Some people, they are so enthusiastic, they want to give da'wah to everyone. Alhamdulillah, reward them. They don't analyze the condition of the person. They don't analyze the environment in which they're giving the da'wah. And some people, they don't worry about it at all. So we find extremes. So we have to take the middle path. So what the scholars have said, and I would like you to remember these principles, and we're talking about infaradi da'wah most probably, that's what we will cover tonight. Now, the first thing is, the person that you see committing wrong, you see him committing wrong, 
If you think that you will go and prevent him now, and you have this fear that he will disrespect the order of Allah. One person is drinking alcohol. One person is drinking alcohol. And he's with his friends, drinking alcohol. Or one person is with a girlfriend amongst his friends. And you go there and tell him, Sharamiyatitum, in front of his friends. He has a girl with in front of his friends. He has no shame. Or he's drinking alcohol with his friends. No shame. He may at that time to save his image, his ego, he may utter a word of kufr. Understood? He may say, I don't believe in Islam. Who said uh, alcohol is haram? Who said to have a girlfriend is haram? You became the means of that statement of kufr. So you have to find out the right time. What is the right time for exercise? Is it in the morning? Is it in, in midday? Is it in the afternoon? Is it at night? What is the right time to exercise? What is the right time to exercise your da'wah? Now if you think that he's going to utter a word of kufr, don't give him da'wah at that time, just walk away. When he comes out of that evil environment, with kind words, as we will speak in a few moments, you give him the da'wah. So if you think that he's going to disrespect the sharia, the divine constitution, at that moment, don't give da'wah. Second, if there is a possibility of both, that he will remain silent, take heed from the da'wah, or he may say something that is wrong, then you have an option. The better option is to give him the da'wah, but before going to him, make dua. That, oh Allah, allow these words to penetrate and allow these words to register properly in his heart so this person can pull away from you. Number three. If you think that you're going to give da'wah to somebody, but he is in the position to hurt you. Like if we go to a politician that has power and we know that he's doing wrong, and I don't want to mention names, and we go to them and say, please don't do this. You have given the da'wah, but after that you're going to be flopped. You be ready for, for a very, very long, painful ordeal. So if you think that you're going to be hurt by saying the right, at that time you have the option. It is better to refrain from it. Try to find a better medium through which you can convey the message. Three words I would like you to remember. Mufti Shafi Sahib, rahimahullah, who is the father of my mentor, Mufti Taqi Usmani Sahib, he says, in regards to da'wah, there are three words. Haqbat, haqbiyat, haqtani. Remember this. This is the gist of da'wah. Haqbat, haqniyat, haqtani. So whenever you give da'wah, first of all, it has to be haq. It has to be the truth. And how are you going to determine if it's the truth? You have to have knowledge. We will speak about that if we have time after that. But first is haqbat. You have to say the truth. Right. Number two, haqniyat. Your intention should be sound. If your intention is not right, it's not going to have a positive impact upon the person. So your, your niyat, your intention should be right. And haq tariqa, the method of approach should be sound. If your method of approach is not right, it's not going to have a good impact. Like we found with the Prophet of Allah, the person that came to ask for zina. The Prophet of Allah's method, he spoke the truth. The Prophet's niyat was right and the approach was right according to the person and it worked. This person, he walked away saying that I dislike zina. That is very, very important. Now, once I went to the hospital, uh, true, true incident, and when you want me to finish, just like this and I'll stop. I went to a hospital once and there was one person who had diabetes. And his foot was to be amputated the next day. And I went as an imam, in the capacity of an imam, I went there to visit this person, knowing that I will visit this person, say, La ba'sa ta'ul inshallah, and I will be rewarded 70,000 angels, making dua for me. I went in there, and I could not stand in that room for more than 10 seconds. There was a stench, smell. 
Woody, but Woody. And I walked out straight away. I said, Salaam to him. La ba'sa tahur, inshallah. Followed the sunnah and walked out. I couldn't stand. But I found that there was a nurse there. She was digging deep into the wound without a mask. She was digging deep into the wound and cleaning it. I was far away and I had to walk out. She was so close to the foot, digging deep, cleaning it, standing there for hours and hours. And what came to my mind, I said, look, this is a malice. This person is a sick person. This is how we give da'wah to a person. When we see a person in wrong, that evil has to be amputated from his life. And we have to approach that person as the nurse approached the sick person on the bed where his foot was to be amputated. Whatever he has done, we are not the judge. We are judgmental. We straight away pass judgment. Why he had diabetes? Was he eating sugar for 30 years, 40 years? That's not the concern of the nurse. What he has done in the past is not her concern. She is treating him now. She's going to not dig out the past and pull out the skeletons. No. We don't have to worry about the past. We look at the person now without being judgmental, without considering ourselves to be better, we treat that person. Without frowning. They were Rahman in Without frowning. With a simple face. With compassion. Think about it. I'm going to give you an example from the Quran. But as a Musa والسلام, was appointed by Allah to speak to the tyrant. Now, when in, even in Urdu, when we speak about a tyrant, we say Fir'aun, Pharaoh, Pharaoh of the time. He has become the epitome of Zulam. Pharaoh has become the epitome of Zulam, the symbol of Zulam. The Prophet of Allah says, Abu Jal is the Pharaoh of this Ummah. Ramses was the Pharaoh of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah Rabbul Izzat points Musa alayhi salatu wasalam to go and speak to who? Fir'aun. And what does Fir'aun say about himself in Surah Nazi'at 79 verse 24? He says, Ana Rabbukumul A'la. I am the most high God. Because they used to believe in many forms of God. I am the most high God. Allah sends Musa والسلام, with Harun والسلام, and Harun والسلام, was his brother, elder brother by three years. Harun والسلام, was his elder brother by three years. Both are sent to who? To Pharaoh, who claims that he is the most high God, challenging the divinity of Allah. Allah what does Allah say? What are the instructions given to Musa والسلام, and Harun? Surah Taha, the 20th Surah of the Quran, verse 44. Verse 44, Surah Taha, Allah says to Musa and Harun, Allah knows he's making a claim of divinity. Allah says to both that when you go to him, speak mildly with him, speak with softness. Do you understand the context? Do you understand the message, how strong that is? That Musa, when you go to this person who claims to be God, speak with softness, mighty. Imam Qurtabi, in his tafsir Qurtabi, extracts from this, ajib nukta, ajib point. He says, now, now, no one can be better than Musa And the person that you give da'wah to be, Dawa too cannot be worse than Fir'aun. Wherever we stand, the person giving Dawa cannot be better than Moses. And the person that you invite cannot be worse than Pharaoh. So if the law applied to Musa in relation to Pharaoh, the law will apply to you as well. So it doesn't matter what the person has done. We have to be very soft in our approach. And remember this. 
This is very, very important. That the person is sick and we are approaching this person. And we can't be judgmental. This is a epidemic. This is a uh, sickness, an ailment that is widespread. We become judgmental. And remember, even if you don't utter the words, if the person feels better inside, it is going to have a negative impact upon the addressee. That is a certainty. Now, <clears throat> there is some misconceptions regarding da'wah. We're you know, highlighting a few points here and there because of the uh, restriction of time. There is a verse in Surah Saf. Now, surah Saf is the 61st Surah of the Quran. And it is verse number 2. In which Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, lima taquluna ma la tafa'aloon. Remember this. Used many a times by people without understanding the context. What does Allah say? It is a very clear verse. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, lima taquluna ma la tafa'aloon. Oh believers, why do you say that which you do not do yourself? So people use this verse by the apparent translation and they make this claim that if you are not practicing, you are not allowed to give da'wah. Do you understand? Have you heard this many times? If you are not practicing, don't give da'wah. If you are not praying, don't invite people to pray. So what they are trying to say, if a, if a father did not become a hafiz, he's not allowed to tell his child to become a hafiz. If the father did not pray in his life, he's not allowed to tell his child to pray. This is wrong. This understanding of this verse is wrong. And there's another verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 44. You order people to do good and you forget yourself. For example, when the Prophet of Allah went to visit that child, that Jewish child that was dying, the very famous incident, the Jewish child was dying. The Prophet of Allah went at that last moment to salvage this soul, to save this soul from the wrath of Allah. And he went to this child and he said, read the kalim. The child looked at his father. Father is a Jew. He looked at his father. And what did the father say? Read the creed of Abu Qasim. The father is a Jew. He's telling the child, Musamanudu. The child read the kalima. The Prophet walked out and said, Alhamdulillah, one soul is saved. You order your child to do good and you forget yourself. You order your child to do good and you forget yourself. Now keep in mind the meaning of this verse is do not make a claim to virtue if you are not virtuous. That is the meaning of it. One person does not pray and he is giving dawah to others and he says, I pray tahajjud. I establish five salahs in my life. He makes a claim to piety, knowing that he has no piety in his life and gives dawah, that is wrong. That is a deception, a form of deception. But if a person wants to give dawah to people, knowing that there is deficiency in his life, this is the best method of reforming yourself. If you have any deficiency in your life, for example, one person can't make up for tahajjud, for example, start speaking about tahajjud. Invite others to tahajjud. This will become the means of your establishment of tahajjud in your life. So the scholars have said, like Mawlana Shibli Thani, rahimahullah, he makes mention, and many other scholars I've heard from Mufti Taqi Usmani Sahib as well, that if they found themselves weak in any faculty of life, they gave a speech about it. And by giving a speech regarding that topic, they found themselves to establish that in their life. And Allah Rabbul Lizzat uprooted the deficiency. <clears throat> Another aspect regarding da'wah is we are here to save ourselves and save others, as I made mention. And you will understand, we are not highway robbers. You can say, what connection does that have with da'wah? <clears throat> For example, Imam A'mash, who was the teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa, one of the great scholars in the early stages of Islam, Imam Amish, he was one eyed person. He had a student whose name was Araj. He used to walk on one leg. So, teacher half blind, 
and student crippled from one leg. Some students, they are very close with the teacher. They're never apart from the teacher. They're always with the teacher. So one day, Imam Amash, uh, teacher, Imam Araj, student, they are walking together in the shopping center. It gives people the opportunity to taunt, to mock. Then they go, Ustad and the Oshagir Langana. They started to use this language. Look at the teacher, half blind, and look at the student, he's crippled. One legged person. So Imam Amish, the teacher, heard this. Came back. When he came back, <coughs> Imam Amish said to his student that from tomorrow I do not want you to be around me outside. I don't want you to walk with me outside. Imam Amish said, Oh, teacher, why? He said, Don't, didn't you hear what people were saying? He said, yeah. No problem. They're giving all their rewards to us. Remember, you know when a person, I, I've come up with this example and it makes it easy for us to understand. When we make riba, for example, riba. If I say to this brother, his, he shares my name, his name is Uzair. If I take his credit card, take his credit card, I can't use it because I don't have the PIN number. And if I ask him for the PIN number, he'll never give the PIN number. Forget about Uzair who shares my name. My wife won't even give her PIN number to me. No one shares the PIN number. No one shares the PIN number. It's very sacred, very valuable. Whenever a person, remember this, I think this will register well with you. Whenever a person breaks the rights of another person through the channel of riba, through the channel of buhtan, through the channel of lying, he has given his pin number of good deeds to that person. Remember that. Your pin number has been given. You don't even know about it. He's swiping it. And all your good deeds are being transferred into the account of that person. Remember that. In this world, we don't give our pin number to anyone. But in regards to deen, we are giving our pin number to so many. So Imam Amr said, from tomorrow, I don't want you to walk with me or to be around me. So what does Imam Amr uh, say? Imam Amr said, nothing to worry about. They are speaking in of us. All their good deeds are being transferred into our account. Imam Amr said, Ham yahan lutere ban Ham to apna bhi iman, unka bhi iman salim rakhna chate. We have not come as highway robbers. We have come to save our faith and save their faith as well. So these were a few fine points that I wanted to share with you. We have run out of time. You can conclude in five minutes. I can conclude in five minutes. Now, in regards to one statement, I would like you to uh, register to mine and we will conclude on this. In regards to Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi anil Mudga, there are five, five tools by which we can attain maximum benefit from our da'wah. Number one, that the da'wah that we should give should be beautified with correct knowledge. I spoke about this, I touched upon it. Knowledge is very, very important, the knowledge. So we should know how to approach and what to say. If sometimes you are confronted by a question and you do not know how to reply, it is better to remain silent than say a word that you cannot retract. So ilm is very, very important. That's why insan has been given preference, superiority over the malaika because we have ilm, ilmul ashya. We have been given knowledge. So knowledge is very important. Second thing is that when we give the dawah, this we are concluding now, when we give the dawah, it is to please Allah. So first is knowledge. Second is we give dawah to please Allah. Number three, we are soft in our tone. And we spoke about this. There's a verse in Surah Taha, Surah 20, verse 44, in which Allah says to Musa and Harun, be soft in your approach with Pharaoh. The fourth one that we have not touched upon, and this is very important, and that is a verse in Surah Luqman. Now, surah Luqman is the 31st Surah, it is verse 17, in which Allah says through Hazrat Luqman to his son, Wasbir ala ma asab. That whenever you give da'wah, 
you may face some unfavorable circumstances. Endure it. Somebody is very, very important. Don't think that you will go out and straight away see results. No, no, no. You speak to your child once and you think it's going to be all over? You go out and you speak to one person and you think it's all over? Alama Shibli Numania said that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam invited Abu Jal 3,000 times. 3,000 times Abu Al-Hakam was invited to be. And the Prophet of Allah knew that he was going to die as a kafir. 3,000 times. How many a times we read in the Quran? I would like you to go back and study Surah A'raf, Surah Hud and Surah Shu'ra. Surah number one? Hud. Number two? A'raf. Number three, Surah Shu'ra. Allah speaks about Hazrat Nuh alayhi salatu salam, Hazrat Hud alayhi salatu salam, Hazrat Salih alayhi salatu salam, Hazrat Shu'ib alayhi salatu salam, Hazrat Lut alayhi salatu salam, Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu salam. In order, the same order in three surahs. What do they say? The people, they confront the prophets and they say, Inna lana raka fi safaha wa inni lana dhunnuka min al-kadhi. We find you to be Man, and we find you to be a liar. If you call a liar a liar on his face, he will be very upset. A liar, you call him a liar. He can't take this. They used to say to the prophets, You are mad people, you are liars. What do they reply with? Ya I'm not a mad person. I'm a Rasul from Allah. This used to be the approach. Sabr is very, very important. Eh? Sabr, patience. It is our business. You know, they say if you open a business, the first year you're not going to get any profit. Second year you may not even get profit. So after three years you start to get the profit. So this is our business. We're inviting this person. This is our business of Akhirah. Tijaratul Lan A trade that will never go wrong. It takes time, but we never give in. It is our business of Akhirah. And the last thing, and we will conclude on this, is that try to practice it yourself. And if you can't practice it, preach about it so it comes into your life. Allah Rabbul Izzah give us tawfiq to implement what we have heard.